Ladies and gentlemen, if I could uh, call our session to order. Uh, welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. My name is Mark Medish, and I'm a Vice President for Studies here. We have a great program for you this afternoon featuring Dr. Joseph Stiglitz of Columbia University and Steve Muffson of the Washington Post. Dr. Stiglitz is co-author with Linda Vilmes of the Three Trillion Dollar War, The True Cost of the Iraq Conflict, just published by Norton. It's an extremely timely and important book on the economics of this war. Um, it tries to gauge the full costs to the U.S. of the prosecution of this war uh, and, and goes well beyond the official statistics. It has a lot to say about magnitudes and methodologies. It tries to take account of macroeconomic costs, social costs, and even opportunity costs, which is particularly appropriate in the case of a war of choice. On my way here, I saw a bumper sticker, uh, Dr. Stiglitz, on a, on a car that happened to be festooned with Obama stickers as well, and it said, war is costly, peace is priceless. And in many ways, your book aims to help us think through just how costly this war uh, really is to the United States. Um, I should note that the book is dedicated to the troops serving and the veterans who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Dr. Stiglitz is one of those people who doesn't need an introduction. The problem with being a person who doesn't need an introduction is that you rarely get the kind of introduction you deserve. <laughs> Uh, but let me just say a few words. He is university professor at Columbia University and chair of their Committee on Global Thought. He uh, served on the Council of Economic Advisors from 1993 to 1997, uh, including as chairman uh, for the last three years of that period. He was chief economist of the World Bank. Um, he's had a very distinguished career in academia and in policy. By the way, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001, <laughs> and he won the, uh, the John Bates Clark Prize uh, in 1979, which economists in the audience uh, will understand the significance of as well. We're also joined by Steve Muffson of the Washington Post. Steve is uh, currently the energy correspondent for the Post. Uh, he's had a, a, a long and distinguished career there, uh, uh, working at the Post since 1989. He was previously deputy editor of Outlook. Um, he's uh, been on the economics beat. He's been the Beijing correspondent. He's covered foreign policy uh, and, and numerous other beats. He also wrote uh, at the Wall Street Journal in the 1980s, so we're delighted to have him here. Our format today is that uh, Dr. Stiglitz will give an opening presentation, uh, and this will be followed by a conversation up here among the armchairs, uh, guided by Steve Muffson, and then we'll open it up to a broader conversation. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, give the podium to Dr. Joseph Stiglitz. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about what I view as obviously a very important issue. When, when uh, the U.S. went to war, uh, and this was, as Mark said, a, a war of choice, uh, the one person in the administration, Larry Lindsay, said the war might cost 100 to $200 billion. And for that uh, rare moment of, of honesty, he was rewarded with being fired. Uh, the administration, uh, Rumsfeld said baloney, and the administration came back <laughs> with the number 50 to $60 billion. We are now spending that amount up front every three months. When I say up front, what I want to emphasize is that the actual cost of the operations are just a fraction of the total cost, and that's what I'm going to be coming to. Uh, that as long as troops are there, there are going to be disabilities. When they're disabled, we have to pay disability compensation and health care costs. And these other costs double, uh, uh, can double the, 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 the $12 billion a month uh, that we are, are spending. Uh, the, 
uh, it's hard to get your mind around, uh, wrap your mind around what is $3 trillion uh, other than to say it's a big number. Uh, but in some ways what we said is that we've introduced a new metric, a new way of thinking. Uh, you can ask, uh, what could you have solved with a day's fighting, an hour's fighting, a minute's fighting? Uh, what a fraction of an Iraq war would have cost? So you may remember uh, at the beginning of the President Bush's uh, second term, he talked about the country facing a major financial problem in the uh, gap in our Social Security, the funding of our Social Security system. And arguably we had to privatize it, dramatic uh, problems that we weren't, weren't going to be able to, to uh, uh, live up to the commitments that we have made to our elderly. Well, for roughly uh, a sixth of the cost of an Iraq war, you could have put the Social Security system on firm financial footing for the next 50 to 75 years. Put another example, um, there is a, a, a major problem of autism in, in the United States. One out of 150 kids are being born with that are autistic. We don't understand why. The clear, clear sense that we, we need to do more research on this topic. We could double the amount of research that we do on this subject for a few hours of fighting in Iraq. So the, the span, the kinds of, of numbers, the ways of trying to get a hold of, of what $3 trillion might mean. Economists use the concept of opportunity cost, what you could have done with that money. But there's another opportunity cost, which is the security opportunity cost. Uh, one of the responses that, uh, to, to some of, of what we, uh, to our, our research has been, well, uh, security, our security is priceless. But in fact, uh, we have a limited amount of resources, and if you're focusing on one problem, you're not focusing on some other problem. So while we were focusing on weapons of mass destruction that did not exist in Iraq, Another country, North Korea, became a nuclear power. While we were focusing on a country that had nothing to do with 9-11, the war in Afghanistan, which did have something to do with 9-11, has gone very badly. And while there was no connection with Al-Qaeda in the beginning, now Al-Qaeda is active in Iraq. So there is a sense in which our national security is actually worse. And, and a vast majority of the, of the generals uh, of the military have actually said we are less prepared today to meet security threats than we were five years ago. So this is part of the, of, of the cost of the war. But that's part of the cost of the war that we do not quantify. What we try to do is to say, okay, we're not going to, to, to look at all the aspects of, of the decision of, of, of the war, but at least the American citizens ought to know what this war is costing the economy, what is costing them. And once you begin to, to um, uh, look through the various categories of cost, you realize that in fact a uh, $3 trillion is a vast underestimate of the true cost. In our book, we give a range of numbers, three to five trillion dollars, and and we actually, you know, think that the number is is almost surely greater than three trillion. Let me just very quickly go through and how you go from the numbers that the administration admits to to these larger numbers. Well, as I say, first there is the direct operation cost. Remember, the administration said it was going to cost fifty to sixty billion. Well, what we've already spent is the order of magnitude of $600 billion, 10 times what they've said, and we're spending $12 billion a month. But the actual cost of operations almost surely goes beyond the amounts that they are willing to admit to up front. Since the war began, our cumulative expenditures in the Defense Department, beyond what is attributed to Afghanistan and Iraq, have gone up by uh, in excess of $500 billion. There's no new enemies. The question is, where is that money going? 
at least for a part of that has to do with the Iraq war. I mean, the obvious example, but it's only a, a little part of it, is that because the war is so unpopular and because the way we've treated our veterans, something I'm going to come to in a minute, the way we treat our veterans is so bad, it's become difficult to recruit. And we've had to pay our, our soldiers more. We've had uh, very large enlistment bonuses and re-enlistment bonuses. And those don't show up, except for the soldiers actually fighting in Iraq, in the Iraq budget. But they are part of the cost of, of the war. So in our estimate, we take a, 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 only 25% of this excess uh, spending and attribute it to Iraq. Then, of course, there are the mo large categories of expenditures that we have not yet paid. And these fall into to, uh, uh, three major categories. The first is the war is going on. We are continuing to spend $12 billion a month up front in operations. In fact, though, we are requiring our military to do longer um, uh, deployments and shorter periods in between. They are becoming very depleted, as I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, uh, that means even to stay still, to continue the level of effort, it will cost us more per month. The mo per monthly cost has gone up from $4 billion a month at the beginning of the war to $12 billion a month now. So we stay, the mounts are going to go, are, are going to continue to go up. We haven't built, in our estimate, the full increase of that. But we base it on, on a variety of, of CBO and Defense Department estimates that uh, we look at a range of, of disengagements. We don't look at either the immediate disengagement scenario or the scenario that says we're going to be there for 100 years. Uh, we look at scenarios that will involve disengagement between now and 2017, relatively fast or uh, more moderate disengagement. So that's the first, continuing operational cost. Uh, the second is that when we leave, we not only have to pay the cost of, de of demobilization, we will have to spend a considerable amount of money to restore the military to its pre-war strength. Uh, in spite of uh, the fact that we are paying higher uh, salaries and enlistment bonuses, the quality of our armed forces in most metrics has been going down. The fraction of high school graduates has been going down. The fraction of convicted felons has been going up. And, and that will cost money to restore them to the kind of quality that we would like to have. But even more important, we've been depleting our uh, uh, military equipment faster than we've been repairing and replacing it, and that too will cost money. And then the final category is uh, the category is, is veterans. Forty percent of uh, our veterans, we estimate, will come back with some kind of disability. Just to put this in perspective, you remember the short war in Gulf War, in the first Gulf War, in one month, we thought it was a war for free. We thought other people were going to pay for it. We are now spending $4.3 billion a year on disability pay. Now, you just think about that for a short war. Now, we have a war going on for five years and continuing, a war in which the, the people coming back with disabilities are coming back with many more disabilities than in the previous war. And the likely, and, and many of them are more, much more severe. Uh, the psychological problems are, 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 are you know, increased with each, re, each deployment, and that we are now asking the people to serve two, three, and four deployments. Uh, the costs are, are likely to be very, very large. We estimate that the future cost of these uh, disabilities, uh, including the Social Security system, which is something that, that they get eligible for dis Social Security, um, uh, but, and the health care cost uh, in excess of $600 billion. I'll come back to this. But this is an unfunded entitlement that we have created in the last five years uh, of $600 billion. So when you add up these, these are the budgetary costs that we can see easily, that we can calculate easily. And it's, you go from the $600 billion 
that we've already spent and very easily get to two to three hundred, uh, two to three trillion dollars in budgetary costs. But then we go beyond the budgetary cost and we look at both the micro and the macro uh, costs. On the micro side, um, for instance, are the fact that the amount that the government pays for disability or for deaths is a fraction of the cost to our society and to the families. So, for instance, in one out of five families in which somebody has been seriously disabled, somebody has to give up a job to take care of them. The disability pay does not measure the loss of, of income, let alone the pain and suffering that they've suffered. The, disability, the, the death benefit, they call it a death gratuity, is $500,000. The government in its own uh, you know, accounting, when it evaluates a safety regulation or an environmental regulation, looks at the cost of the regulation and looks at the value of the life saved. And it does. It's an unpleasant thing, but you have to value life. And the number they use is seven, uh, seven, between seven and eight million dollars. That's much larger than 500,000. So there's a gap between the societal cost and the budgetary cost. There are a, lot of, a number of others, but these are the main, one that we focus, uh, main ones that we focus on. And then, finally, there are the macroeconomic costs. First, we dispel the view that, unfortunately, it's been around for a long time, that wars are good for the economy. Uh, that was a view that was generated by World War II which is widely seen as helping uh, the world get out of the Great Depression. Uh, but at least since Keynes, we know that there are better ways of stimulating aggregate demand, stimulating the economy. You don't need to have wars to keep the economy at full employment. We can spend money in ways that lead to long-run productivity increases in standard of livings. The war is about the worst way of spending, and this particular war is particularly bad. Uh, Money spent to hire a Naples contractor working in Iraq does not stimulate the economy in the same way that money spent on a hospital in the United States or a road in the United States or in a school in the United States would have stimulated the economy. This war is also bad because it's been associated with an increase in the price of oil. Hard to remember, but just five years ago, the price of oil was $23, $25 a barrel, and futures markets saw a su uh, forecast that the price of oil would remain at that level for the next decade or more. They understood that there was going to be an increase in demand from China and emerging markets, but they also believed that there would be an increase in supply. The low-cost provider was the Middle East, large supplies of, of oil. The war upset that equation. And while in our book, we only attribute 5 to $10 of the increase of the 75 to $85 uh, of the uh, increase in the price of oil to the war, uh, we actually think the, the number is, is much larger. And that's why I say you know, our numbers, we, we feel very convinced, are, are, are very conservative. The war, this war has also been different from any other war in a couple of other ways. One of the ways in which it's different is that this is the first war in uh, America's history where at the time we went to war, we didn't have a conversation about how we were going to finance it. Uh, there was not a discussion. As you send off your young men and women to fight, there's not a discussion of shared sacrifice. And the way middle-aged middle people can share in that sacrifice is to have a tax increase to pay for at least part of the cost of the war. This is the first time as we went to war, we had a deficit, and we responded by saying the shared sacrifices, the rest of America would have to consume more and spend more time in the shopping malls. We had a tax cut for upper-income Americans as we went to war. That means that every cent, in a sense, has been borrowed. This is the first war since the Revolutionary War that we've had to turn largely to, to a significant extent to foreigners to finance our war, 40% has been borrowed from abroad. That means, in turn, that our living standards in the future are going to be lower than they otherwise would have been. We will have to pay interest. We will 
Perhaps we will repay the debt. No matter what you're doing, there is no free lunch, as economists put it, or put it in this context, there's no such thing as a free war. The Bush administration was trying to persuade America that they could have a war for free. After all, it was just a volunteer army that was fighting it. Not really quite volunteer, because many of them were not doing it voluntarily. There were National Guard that thought they had volunteered for a things like Hurricane Katrina. They didn't volunteer for extended duty in, in Iraq. And the stop-loss provisions, they thought they had signed up for three years, told, no, you, can, you, you didn't read the fine print. And you would have said, seen that you signed up for eight years. And we can tell you not that you can't leave. So it's not really quite the all-voluntary uh, army that, that, that people have, have suggested, but, but it is one in which most Americans uh, have not had to, to give up, ha send their children, a large, the smallest percentage serving um, in, in our, probably in our, in our history, and, uh, or at least recent history. And uh, in, ter in terms of the cost, it's all been pushed onto future generations. And so, in, in a sense, uh, that the, the, the notion that people would not feel the cost of war was part of the deliberate strategy. Uh, now, we end the book by a discussion of a number of policies, um, uh, recommendations, trying to think about how can we prevent or at least reduce the likelihood of the kind of problems that, that we've seen. And uh, let me just very quickly mention three of, two or three or four of these. Uh, one of them is the appropriations process. Uh, this war has been funded by 24 separate appropriations bills. It's been funded in drebs and drabs, so nobody really saw the full what was really going on. By emergency appropriations, emergencies make sense or appropriate at the beginning of the war when you have a hurricane that you cannot anticipate. But five years into the war, you should not be funding a war with emergency appropriations that are not subject to the kind of scrutiny that ordinary appropriations are. And that's why there's been all these problems with, with profiteering, profit problems with, with, with cost management. So one recommendation is that, you know, at least after the first year or two, you should have you should you should use regular appropriations, and if if you say there's an emergency, you have to go before Congress and say things are not going the way we thought. We made a mistake. We these are not anticipatable. The um, uh, second uh, kind of a uh, recommendation is has to do with our accounting procedures. We use cash accounting then rather than accrual accounting. Uh, countries that have, have really tried to get their, their, their accounts in order use accrual accounting. Every business uses accrual accounting. Every major business beyond a corner grocery store uses accrual accounting. And the obvious reason, accounting systems are important because they are the way we think about information, the way we organize information. And if you use cash accounting, you focus on your cash expenditures. And so you try to reduce your cash expenditures, but that means that there are accrued expenditures going out that you're not focusing on. And that leads to a systematic, uh, uh, systematic consequences of what you call penny wise and pound foolish. So let me give you an example, something where, where we had to use the Freedom of Information Act to find out what was going on. You know, the president said he was giving the troops all, everything they needed. But what we discovered was that the commanders uh, in Iraq had asked for the MRAPs, these vehicles, the specially designed vehicles, designed to resist explosive devices, as early as the beginning of 2005. And had they had these, a large number of deaths and disabilities would have been avoided. <coughs> but buying them would have raised the upfront cost, the cash cost, those that showed on the counts. What doesn't show on the counts are the future disability payments that accrue because you did not protect our soldiers, our troops. So 
uh, as long as Rumsfeld there was there, we never ordered these MRAPs. It wasn't until Gates became the Secretary of Defense that these the, the, that these were ordered. So that's an example of, of of how focusing on the cash, we actually wound up increasing our total our total cost. Uh, so we really need to go to another accounting framework. In modern war, this is becoming more important. Another way this war differs from previous wars is the ratio of disabilities to deaths is much higher. Previous war has been two and a half to one. This war is 15 to one. It's a testimony to modern medicine, but it has economic implications. And we have to prepare for those economic implications. And that's the third uh, recommendation, kind of recommendation. Uh, and it's, it's actually related to a whole set of recommendations. The way we've been treating our returning veterans is, is disgraceful. Uh, the, the, the story that you saw of Walter Reed is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as late as 2005 and 6, we were providing funds to the Veterans Administration on the basis of data from 2002 before the war, as if there were no people disabled in this war. And so obviously the VA has been running out of money, had to go back again for emergency appropriations. So what we argue is there should not be unfundled entitlements like this. We should have put aside, we should finance. If we say the war is worth fighting, we should say we will not only pay for it, we will put aside the money to pay for the disabled that the war generates. So these are some of the kinds of policy recommendations that, we've, uh, that we looked at. Finally, let me just mention that uh, while we began this book uh, as, uh, might say, an exercise in boring economics and accounting, uh, that we, we thought, you know, Americans ought to know what the war was costing. We thought this was something the government ought to be doing. We should not have written the book. It, this is information the government uh, should have been providing, but it hadn't done what it should have done. Now, there's a certain irony here. We were we were talking about going for uh, fighting for democracy, but democracy is more than periodic elections. Democracy entails informed citizenry being involved in the decisions that affect their lives. And part of being informed is knowing the cost of what you're doing, particularly when it's a war of choice. Well, uh, one of the things that we came to understand as we wrote the book is how difficult it is to get the information. Uh, and we had to repeatedly uh, work with veterans groups to get uh, use Freedom of Information Act to find out uh, what was going on. We wound up doing what we might call investigative reporting. Uh, what we we um, uh, you know scandals of the kind that you know I would talk to Linda and say, "Are you sure?" And you know we couldn't believe our uh, what we saw, and and we check it and. And continually, you know, scandalized. I mean, let me just give you uh, one example I've already given you is the MRAPs. Uh, another example is the number of people injured that appears on the Department of Defense website is roughly about half of the true number. And it was only through the uh, working with the veterans groups to find in Freedom of Information Act that we, we found out the true number. If you look at the number of fatalities, they list the fatalities, whether they are fatalities associated with hostile action or non-hostile action. What they don't tell you is that on the injuries, they only talk about combat-related injuries. And they get to decide what is a combat-related injury. If you're flying a helicopter at night because it's too dangerous to fly a day and it crashes, that's non-combat. If you're in a convoy and the first uh, vehicle in the convoy explodes with an IED, that's obviously hostile combat. But if the second one crashes into the first one because it's blown up, that's just an automobile accident. And it's not listed, it may not be listed in the, in the hostile action category. And, and these differences are large. As I say, it's roughly 50% that are reported. But from the point of view of the taxpayer, from the point of view of our obligations to our troops that are fighting for us, there is no distinction made whether it was hostile or non-hostile. And that will be part of the cost 
of the war that we will be paying for decades to come. Finally, the big issue of the day is where do we go from here? That's a difficult issue, and, and there's obviously a lot of uncertainty. What we try to suggest is there's a way of thinking about this that our kind of analysis may help in. Most people, almost everybody says we should withdraw at some point. It's only a question of when. Now, or, you know, within the next couple of years, or four or five years, stay the course. Now, there is uncertainty about what will happen when we withdraw. Some people think there will chaos will break out. Some people, and actually most Iraqis believe things will get better. But that's not the issue in a way. The question is, if we withdraw today, there may be chaos. If we withdraw in four years, there may be chaos. If we withdraw today, there may be, things may be better. And withdraw in four years, there may be better. The question is, what is the difference? What do we buy by staying there four more years? Is the chaos going to be reduced so much that it is worth spending another $1.2 trillion or more? Or are there ways of spending that $1.2 trillion that will be better for our economy, better for our security, than this particular way of spending $1.2 trillion? Economists are, you know, economics is called the dismal science, and, and, and the nature of the dismal science is that it reminds people that resources are limited uh, and that we have to make choices. And these are the kinds of choices that, that, are, that we, the election, and our political leaders are going to have to make. Um, and they simply cannot ignore the fact that uh, our resources are limited and uh, we have to ask the question, what is the best way of using those limited resources? Thank you. We'll just adjust the microphones here. Joe, th thank you very much for that uh, excellent summary of your findings and recommendations. Um, I'm sure you've provoked a lot of questions in the audience, but we're going to start with uh, your neighbor Steve Mufson's questions in just a second. So, Steve, let me turn it over to you to, to get the conversation going. Thanks, Steve. Mark. Um, it's um, it's in a, in a, I feel in a bit of a funny position because three trillion is just such a huge number. I mean, even if I knock a trillion off that, that's still a pretty huge number, and none of your points seem to really uh, change with that. So. At the risk of quibbling, uh, I'll ask you a couple of questions <laughs> about numbers and, and uh, a couple of larger questions. And I thought I'd start with the uh, larger question, which is really one about what the baseline is. Um, you're using, and I mean that in every sense of the word, right, both budgetary baseline, but also, you know, the baseline is connected to foreign policy and all sorts of other scenarios about what might have happened had we not invaded. Um, and I'd just like to mention a few of them that maybe you want to talk about. One is, um, you know, did you really, does, could one really have expected that status quo with the oil for food program and the no-fly zone to have continued indefinitely? What kind of costs? And I know in your book you, you subtract the, uh, the cost of the no-fly uh, zone program, which we discontinued, obviously. So that, I understand that. But... But, it, you know, it's possible that those costs could have changed in some um, more disadvantageous way for the budget. Or, alternately, you could have had a scenario um, on the eve of the war. Jessica Matthews had written a piece about how we should use the military to enforce inspections. That would have created a whole different level of spending, even without war, and was the kind of thing that a lot of people were talking about as an alternative to war, given where things were in this stalemate. Uh, between the U.S. and Iraq. And then there's also other possible scenarios. I mean, how long would Saddam Hussein have gone on even without, without a war? And what kind of costs might there have been in terms of regime collapse uh, or some other uh, thing that might have happened? Presumably, he wouldn't have gone on forever. And finally, there's the, uh, the other issue, which is 
had we not gone to war with Iraq, would we have gone to war somewhere else? I mean, it's hard to think of an American, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's hard to think of an administration that hasn't chosen to go, go to war somewhere, actually, at some point, for better or for worse. And, you know, maybe it would have been North Korea or Iran or something like that, but it doesn't seem likely, um, given our nation's history, that, that we would have gone on without something happening. So maybe you could just talk about this sure. baseline, because aside from subtracting the, the no-fly cost, okay. you were pretty much assuming the status quo. Yeah, I, that's a very good question. It's something that we struggled with. Uh, uh, the way economists use the, just the uh, uh, vocabulary, we, we talk about the counterfactual, what would have happened but for the war. And there's, there's no way f to be really sure what those alternatives are, and, and there are a million different scenarios that you can conjure up. And, and it, in a sense, uh, you know, we feel convinced that, that uh, the baseline, the counterfactual that we uh, used was probably the, the best one, but there are these alternatives uh, that, that uh, uh, you have to uh, think about. Um, one example of, of this is, is this issue of uh, what would have you know? Uh, what would have happened to Saddam Hussein? Um, and it, it reminds me of a little bit about uh, the discussion in Indonesia just a decade ago, where where uh, people talked about uh, the the uh, role of the financial collapse. One of the benefits of the financial collapse in Indonesia was that Suharto uh, was removed. Well, um, we now know Suharto was very sick. He would not have been able to, to, to stay in. Uh, that somehow, even though he was a, he was a, a, a very strong uh, president, he had allowed civil society to flourish. And uh, as he left, there, there has been a flourishing of civil society. It probably would have happened. When he left, justifying the World Bank program there, right? and and <laughs> so the, the, the argument was the justification of the disaster of the IMF and the World Bank program was it got rid of Suharto. So what if forty percent of the uh, the unemployment rate got up to forty percent? Um, you know, uh, my view was that was not uh, it, it was not really something that we we ought to include in the benefit because he would. He would have he would have gone anyway. And the same thing uh, in the case of Saddam. We don't know. We don't know if when he died there could have the same conflict that that we now see could have could have emerged. And we all we did is accelerate it. Mm -hmm. And so you shouldn't be blaming all this conflict on us. The the real point is we just accelerated. On the other hand, what is clear is that the way we came in to Iraq, mismanaged the whole process from the beginning, didn't engage in reconstruction, allowed the arms to get around to, to everybody, uh, unemployment soared to 60 percent, um, uh, and, and unemployed young men with guns are an explosive mixture, predictably exploded. You can say, well, you know, uh, it it could have happened otherwise, but you couldn't have done anything more to make it more likely that the thing exploded. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to say, well, we, we have to have some culpability for, for that and, and in terms of the, that kind of a baseline. Um, the, uh, I, mean, I would like to think, and, and certainly uh, many people in the military believe, that they are a peacekeeping. Uh, organization, not a war. Uh, that uh, and and you 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 might have hoped that if we were going to war, uh, we were going to use them. We would find uh, places like Panama, uh, where the resistance is relatively low, and uh, fewer people, <laughs> Americans get killed, and fewer Panamanians uh, get got killed. So uh, if you're going to 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 pick up a, uh, what Mark said, if you're going to have a war of choice. Uh, you ought to choose it a little bit more carefully. And, uh, you know, people say, well, we got rid of a dictator. I often think, well, uh, let's make a list of all the bad dictators in the world 
and uh, let's put a price tag. How much it would have cost to get rid of uh, each of them? And for three trillion, I think we could have gotten a lot more dictators uh, <laughs> than, in fact, we wound up getting for for what we got. What is the going rate? For I, I, <laughs> <laughs> so, so no matter how you look at it, uh, you know, it's a lot of money, and and. Uh, uh, yes, uh, some of these alternatives uh, mean that the incremental cost may have been uh, a little bit higher. The baseline would have been higher, but but as you say, it might have been 2.8 trillion. But remember, our estimate is three to five trillion. So we're we're, we're I'm talking about three trillion. We're trying to be deliberately conservative. Right. Well, and in, in, in a similar kind of question, looking forward instead of backward is the, the issue of the cost of withdrawal. Because you're, you're thinking about this, in, again, in budgetary terms, which is the whole point, of course. But um, I wonder you know, if you were an incoming administration trying to decide, let's say, even a democratic administration on the off chance that might happen, then you're trying to think about what those costs of withdrawal are, and they go beyond the budgetary ones, too. And there, I mean, there may be, or, or even uh, they may include budgetary costs if there is some sort of increase in terrorist threat and that sort of thing. No, I agree. I, I agree completely. But that's why the way, why I emphasize the way we ought to be thinking about it. Um, if there are costs to say increase chaos, and we withdraw in four years, we get we pay that cost. So the question is, we're going to be paying the cost either today or in four years' time. You're assuming and, chaos no matter when we leave. Well, but that's the way the question is. You have to be persuaded that spending $1.2 <clears throat> trillion dollars extra, extra between now and four years is going to have a significant reduction in the probability of chaos. Right. Now, we've been told, you know, uh, the turning point is just around the corner. Um, you know, just this surge, and the surge is going to give us give room for a political agreement, and then we can withdraw. Well, we've had the surge, no political agreement, and, and we see, the, you know, the violent level is going up and down, you know, down, and, and Petraeus is saying, well, we don't know. Now, we may be saying that in a year, and another year, and another year, and another year. Yeah. Um, and so, at the end, these decisions are inevitably done with uncertainty. I don't want to underestimate that. Mm -hmm. But if we spend another $1.2 trillion, that's a lot of money. But the other point is that even focusing on two critical issues, our credibility and our security, our credibility, the respect with which we are held, and say, look, at, now we have a war that we have mismanaged for five years. In four years, we will have a war that we will have mismanaged for nine years. Do we think our credibility was enhanced in Vietnam by staying an extra five years, or was it actually decreased because we refused to face reality and we just stayed on? Well, there is a difference of opinion about that, actually. I mean, there are some people who think that we did somehow enhance our credibility there. But, but that's not what I wanted to focus on. <laughs> I wanted to, but actually, as long as we're talking about economic costs, I mean, in the totally crass way, if you thought that $1.2 trillion would buy you stability, $1.2 trillion, $100 barrel oil, maybe 12 billion barrel reserves, Iraq's got more than that. I mean, on a, on a per barrel cost, that if you really thought you'd buy stability, you could think of worse investments than that. Well, first of all, I didn't, in that $1.2 trillion, include the macroeconomic cost of the chance of more instability from our protracted engagement, mm -hmm. or the fact that because the war is going on, many investors are reluctant to go to the Middle East. So it's actually decreasing uh, potential supply because of, the, of, of our presence there. When I said $1.2 trillion, I didn't include those macro economic costs, mm -hmm. include those that the numbers get, get much, much, much larger. Uh, it seems to me that the second question you have to ask, uh, even if you believe that, that you got more security there, 
is will the problem show up elsewhere? Al Qaeda has moved from Afghanistan to Afghanistan and Iraq. Okay, so we persuade Al Qaeda to move out of Iraq. Is that do we really believe it's going to disappear? Maybe it'll go to Pakistan. There's some evidence that things are so. If, if one one of the ways I, I try to vi I think we should try to visualize this is to think about a big map of the world and realize that. Iraq is a small little dot in that big map. And we're trying to put our finger in a dike. We're focusing on one little piece of territory. And while we're focusing on this, problems are burbling up all over the world. And one of the reasons they're burbling up is because we're not focusing on them because all of our attention is being focused on this particular problem, mm -hmm. which we aren't solving. In fact, I, I heard one security expert uh, put it very graphically. He said, said uh, if you were Al-Qaeda and you were trying to think about what would be in your interest, and he described, well, the thing that would be most in your interest would be a war in Iraq. And that, in fact, we fell into the trap. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me ask you one uh counting question and then maybe open it up to some other questions. And, and that is uh, one person who, who wrote about some of your calculations said that counting the cost of the war and the interest on the war was a little bit like counting the price of the house plus the payment, all the mortgage payments together, it's sort of a double counting. Do you want to? Yeah. Well, we were very that? careful in, th th this was a, a, a issue that came up in our earlier paper that we wrote in, in January 2006. And so in this book, we are very careful when we add on the total, we don't add on the interest so in, our, we, we, in our $3 trillion number. Mm -hmm. But it is still the case that uh, if you ask a family how much they're paying for the mortgage, they include the interest. You know, that's part of the budgetary cost that they face. And so the interest is part of the budgetary cost that our taxpayers are going to have to face. So if you ask, you know, what would we, you know, what do we have to raise taxes to pay for? Let's say that we want to undo the deficits that we've created because of the war. How much do we have to raise the taxes? Well, the fact that we finance the war totally by deficits means that when, 10 years from now, we decide we want to repay that, which I don't know if we will, the amount that we will have to raise our taxes will be that much larger because the debt will be that much larger. But presumably the money you, you didn't pay in taxes, you put to some possibly productive purpose. The productive purpose was with the war. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not sure that, that we are seeing that much return. If you borrowed for the war spending, then the, it, the money you would have spent on the war is... Well, and, and, the, and the answer is basically to keep the economy going and this is actually an important question I was hoping we'd get to, is the link between our current economic problems and, and the war. Uh, you know, I, I described before how the war was exerting this very negative effect on the economy, the higher oil prices, spending that was not stimulative of the economy, deficits. And, and one of the questions is why, why didn't we feel it more? Why didn't we feel it more? And the answer is pretty obvious. The Fed let lose a flood of liquidity, and the regulators looked the other way with lax regulation when we were, you know, really bad mortgages that, that, that were being uh, given out. And this enabled, the result of this was we had a housing bubble and a consumption boom. Savings went down to zero, down to zero. So, you know, it was very clear that we've been living on borrowed money and borrowed time. And it was just a matter of time before a day of reckoning came. So your answer is, what did we do with the money? In effect, we had a consumption binge. And it was a consumption binge, particularly for upper income Americans. But it was a consumption binge, in fact, you know, that, that was shared about with all Americans in, in some sense. And the fact is that we will have to pay the price. We are paying the price for that consumption binge now. And, you know, in, in a way, how much do you blame the Fed? You know, my feeling is the Fed was acting in a short-sighted way, but he said, 
Our task is to keep the economy going for as long as we can. And remember, Ben Bernanke was President Bush's chairman of his Council of Economic Advisors. He had every interest in making sure that the day of reckoning didn't come until after November 2008. Well, you can't always manage these things perfectly, and it started to unravel in August 2007. But it, you know, I and a number of other people just saw it coming as you know, very clear. This is not Monday morning, morning quarterbacking. We pointed out that this, is, this was going to happen. All right, well, let's, let's uh, may I be recognized yeah, for the first sure. question? Uh, <laughs> So I wonder if you could just say a few more words about the, the what I call the comparative economics of war or the, the economics of comparative wars. You mentioned the Vietnam War. Could you try to put your cost assessment of Iraq in relative terms compared with Vietnam, compared with Korean War, compared with World War II, when you add in all the costs of those, of those operations, yeah. and including the Marshall Plan, by the way, because World War II was not just the prosecution of the war, but also the reconstruction effort during the occupation of, of Japan and Germany and, and the rest of the world. Can you, can you, can you give us a sense of yeah, magnitudes? A, a little bit. Um, this is, in terms of the operations, the upfront costs, the second longest war in America's history and the second most expensive war, the only war more expensive. Adjusting for inflation, uh, adjusting for inflation is World War II. So this is a very expensive war. The cost per troop is about eight times the cost in previous wars. So, you know, this, is, this has been a very expensive war. One of the questions that we asked is, you know, why is this war so expensive? We think part of the reason has to do with this is the first war that has been as privatized, where you've relied as much on contractors. Uh, and that part of that has to do is, is that we had this all-volunteer army it's very hard to recruit more people, and so we had to go to, to, to contractors to do things that normally would have been provided by armed forces. But contractors are very, very expensive. Uh, the, 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 they are expensive in many different ways. They were made more expensive by, you might call it the corruption that's associated with what the way, you know, single source contracting, cost plus, reducing the number of auditors, um, you know, the way it's been managed has, has helped increase it. Uh, but, uh, but one of the ironies of it is the contractors are providing competition for the military. So the, the people who've been fighting in, in Iraq say, if I quit and get a, and when, you know, when my term is over, I work for the contractor providing security, my salary would double. Why not? And so the, that forces the armed forces to pay, increase their, their enlistment bonuses. And one of the things that we emphasize in the book is, you know, there are some things where privatization makes sense. But there are some things where privatization doesn't make sense. Running prisons, it doesn't make sense. And mercenary armies have always had a bad reputation. And uh, there's a good reason. National interests do not coincide with profit-maximizing behavior. And I, just, to, I, 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 just to give you an example related to something I was talking about before, uh, at the beginning of the war, unemployment reached 60%. It was in our interest, in terms of winning the hearts and minds, to get that unemployment rate down. But what were the contractors' interests? minimizing cost. So they minimize cost by bringing a Naples worker to work in Iraq, save them money, increase their profit, but undermined our mission. Generated hostility to, you know, resentment to the United States. You know, who, what were we doing? Especially when we were using Iraqi oil to sometimes to pay for these. I would think part of the increased cost would be the high level of technology involved today. Yeah, that, it's next not part the of it. Civil war, right? Where you toss a guy out with boots and a gun. Uh, but no, that that was the beginning part. But now we're not using that. You know, we're, now we're, you know, it's, it's it's a modern version of insurgency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but it's it's not uh, you know it's not cruise missiles that we're using. Uh, so the average soldier is equipped with all sorts of stuff. That's that's right. 
but it, but it's still very very expensive, uh, eight times what it had caused it cost in, in previous wars. Sure. Somebody did not find himself. Um, if you could please identify yourself before you ask your question. Sure. Um, thanks. Uh, Gary Mitchell from the Mitchell Report. I want to ask a, a, a quick two-part question, part of which goes to, to the question Mark asked, and that is, uh, as you know, Robert Hormat's book, uh, he puts this in terms of percent of GDP. And I wonder if you could talk about that. I've heard your, your co-author, Linda, talk about why that's a more difficult uh, task to assess. But could you put the cost of this war uh, in, in the context of uh, – as a percent of GDP. Yeah. The reason why it's difficult, because what when we talk about $3 trillion, we're talking about costs that would be borne over half a century. Uh, the fact is that the veterans cost from World War II peaked in 1993, 48 years after, did I get the arithmetic right? Yeah. yeah 48 years after the end of hostility. Uh, we're going, and, and, and life expectancy is increasing, and so we can expect the, the, the veterans' costs, uh, if we honor our obligations, and I do hope we do, will continue for half a century or more. So that means what you're comparing is uh, the cost is going to be paid over a half a century. In those terms, it's not a big number. And that's why when people say, can we afford it? Yes, we can afford it. Uh, it still has a high opportunity cost, an economic opportunity cost, and a security opportunity cost. And I would emphasize it feeds into this economic downturn that we are experiencing today. That's a real cost. So in terms of, uh, in terms of as a percentage, it's, it's probably lower than in some of our other ventures, and that's why people can have a feeling that we can, we, can, you know, it's war for free. But what I want to, you know, argue is uh, it's not a war for free, and, and we have a lots of, of, of needs that we are not able to meet because of the war. One of them, just one of the things I just want to uh, uh, mention that even Ben Bernanke mentioned, in contrasting this situation, this economic downturn recession with 2001, pointed out that a big difference is that in 2001, we had a 2% of GDP surplus. Now we have a deficit that reduces our room for maneuver. That reduced room for maneuver almost surely will mean our downturn will be longer and more serious than it otherwise would have been. How do we, how do we calculate that cost? Those are gonna be big numbers. Um, yes, right there. Ali Amar from USIP. Um, Ali Amar from USIP. Sir, did you look at uh, how much funding is going to support Iraq's uh, civil society? No. Uh, I, I don't know how much went, went, it was going to, to, to support civil society. What we do look at, uh, we do, do we have one chapter where we, div we look at the cost of the rest of the world. When we say $3 trillion, we're talking the cost to America. And uh, we argue the cost to the rest of the world is probably at least double that. The cost to Iraq has been very serious. You know, four million, more than four million displaced people, two million refugees. The numbers of uh, people, the, the increase in the death rate uh, is huge. You know, various estimates um, based on different epidemiological studies. But no matter what the numbers are, they are very, very large. And we can, if they're, we could talk about that more if we if we want, but the economy has not been able to be reconstructed. Uh, you were mentioning the Marshall Plan. If we had spent the 18 billion that we said we were going to spend on reconstruction, it would have meant per Iraqi a number larger than the Marshall Plan. We didn't get around actually to spending most of the money, and one of the stories that we tell. Uh, what, that we, you know, we, we, we talk about here is why that was turned out to be the case. And it was, it's an interesting story that there was uh, Congress insisted that the bidding be competitive bidding. 
Rumsfeld insisted that it be sole source. You can understand why. Um, Congress said that if you're going to make it sole source, you have to sign and say, you know, it has to be sole source for the following reason. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, well, and he refused to sign that letter, presumably because he couldn't. And in that dispute, the money was not spent. A critical time when, uh, uh, you know, it, where we re where the insurgency began and where we played a critical role in losing the, the, the hearts and minds of the people in Iraq. Um, in that corner, and then we'll go on this side. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rajesh Kadian. Uh, sir, would you also comment on the impact of Iraq on the relative decline of the U.S. dollar vis-a-vis -vis other currencies? <laughs> Well, uh, th that's a hard question. Uh, many factors going into the decline of the U.S. dollar, but clearly uh, one of the factors is an overall loss of confidence, co loss of confidence particularly in the future economic situation, and part of that loss of confidence in the future economic situation is the increase in the national debt, na increase in the national debt associated with the Iraq War. Uh, it's also related to the burgeoning trade deficit, which is related in turn to the increasing oil prices, and uh, that is related also to, to the Iraq War. So there are at least two or three channels through which this war and our inability to manage both the war and the economy well have, have led to this erosion of confidence not leading to the, to, the, to the weaker dollar. Joe, maybe you could say something more about the, that oil price. Is that 5 or $10 just kind of a, a guess? I mean, I, I do this for the Post trying to figure out how to quantify certain political risks and other things that are happening. Very difficult, I think. Did yeah, you're you right. Pull that number out of the air, or, it's not, or is that actually based on something? It's, it's, <laughs> it's not pulled out of the air. It, it it was based on a discussion with lots of people who are e experts in this, all of whom and, said and that guesses. and it's their guesses, <laughs> and and some of this may be consensus. But um, okay. let me tell you what my own uh, one way of thinking about it. My own belief is that most of the increase has to do with the price. With, with the war. And the reason that I believe that is, as I said before, futures markets understood the increase in demand. Future, you know, if you look at where they thought the supply was going to come, they thought it was going to come from the Middle East. Don't and you think the futures markets always predict the same price going on out forever? I mean, oh, right now they're predicting $100 oil yeah. for the next 10 years. But but you have to look at then where did their equations go wrong, okay? Did they misestimate demand? And the answer is a little bit, a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit, and that was a little bit, and that was part of our reason why we didn't attribute 100 percent. Right. But uh, the the big story is is on the supply side. Big story is on the supply side in the Middle East. Now. One of the factors that makes this calculation, that makes the analysis more complicated is there are some peculiarities of the oil market that make, it's not an ordinary competitive demand and supply situation. And in particular, uh, the, uh, you might call it the supply responses from the, the oil producers have this uh, characteristic, they're almost like a backward bending supply curve. What, what happens is that when the price starts to go up, they realize that they need to sell less oil to meet their budget needs. And in fact, they, when the price goes up as much as it's gone up, they face the following problem. What are we going to do with all the money? Where are we going to put it? And uh, they start running into problems that the sovereign wealth funds are running into in, in placing their money. And that leads them to say, in effect, the best way of putting our money is leave it below the ground i.e., leave it in oil below the ground. Rather than pump it all out now, let's, let's pump it out more slowly 
when we need it. Mm -hmm. So as the price goes up, they're actually investing less in expanding capacity, particularly because they know if they expand capacity, pressure will be put on them to use the expanded capacity. Say, well, how can you act as a cartel? Aren't you our friend? They don't have the capacity. They can say, I'm sorry, we're your friend, but we just can't produce anymore. So there is a, a certain supply side dynamic that comes once prices start to go up. And the war is what set off that upward movement in the price that, that led to this, this kind of, of dynamic. So if you ask me, so I think what? I'm just I, trying to think of the idea that high prices somehow re result in fewer supplies, right? Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's a perversity. That's what it's called a backward bending supply curve. And uh, there are a few, you know, markets in which this kind of thing happens, and this happens to be one of them. Uh, and you can understand the rationale of the reason reason for that. And the the um, uh, the bottom line out of this is, I think a very large fraction of the increase can directly and indirectly be attributable to the war. But if you ask anybody, is five or ten dollars an overestimate? Nobody, everybody says no. That, that's an underestimate. We're not sure what the number is, but five or ten dollars is the minimum. This sounds frighteningly like my technique. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, right there. Report. Thank you. How, how much of the three to five trillion dollars is opportunity cost in your estimate? And couldn't you apply opportunity cost to any government program, any government spending? No. Uh, of, of the three to five trillion, let me let me try to make make it clear. Um, the direct budgetary cost, the you know the money that we're spending, is uh, that coming out of the budget, not including interest, is around two trillion. And then there's the interest. Okay. So just that side gets you, get you close to $3 trillion, but not all the way there. Then are the costs that go beyond the budget. And those are real economic costs. The, the people who have to give up the job to care for somebody who is, who is disabled, that's a, that's a real economic cost. Uh, the the uh, uh, There's an economic loss from somebody who dies at the age of 20. There's an economic cost for somebody who is disabled at the age of 20. So those are real economic costs, and we use the standard procedures for estimating those real economic costs. Now the macroeconomic costs are, again, real economic costs. We're, we're going through this, uh, what economists call a counterfactual. What would have been the, 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 the output of the economy were we not spending the money that we're spending on Iraq, uh, on, on Iraqi oil, uh, on, on a higher price of oil. Now, that's where there are, I mean, when you do a count, assumption, uh, analysis like this, there are assumptions. And, I, I, and this, we, here our assumption was 5 to $10 of the increase in the price of oil was due to the war. Then you can go through and say, if the price is 5 or $10 higher, how much money does that mean we're sending to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait? What does that do to the macro economy? You, and so you go through that, that full calculation. Um, and then you ask, if we, weren't, uh, if, we, if we weren't borrowing all this money from abroad, 40 percent, uh, if we borrow that extra money, that is money that we have to pay interest on that lowers our standard of living in the future, what is the cost of that? So those are real calculations. Those are not opportunity costs. I was using the opportunity costs as a way of trying to explain what does $3 trillion mean. You know, somebody said, what is $3 trillion? And the only way I can explain $3 trillion is to say what you could have bought with it, and a lot. Go way in the back, and then we're going to come up here. My name is Kern Shem. I have two little questions. I hope they're little. One, uh, you mentioned that the actual death toll is much higher than the figures that we see. And no, I'm wondering injury toll. Injury toll. I think you said death toll as well. 
No. That's what she said. Oh, I, what I meant to say was injuries. Injuries? Okay. Yeah. Okay, then that kills the first question. Okay, uh, I come from a refugee background, and I'm wondering when the eventual withdrawal occurs, now or in four years, have you made any estimate as to the cost of absorbing the, for lack of a better term, collaborators who are going to have to come to the United States for safety? No, that's a, that's, that, that is an important cost uh, that we, we, we'll, we'll need to deal with. Uh, you know, one of the reasons, of course, is one has to ask what kind of peace will they have in Iraq if they get peace when we leave. Uh, it may be the country will divide into three parts in which they divide themselves into three different places. And, and, and so we don't know the answer of what that political, uh, I don't want to say agreement, the political outcome uh, that will emerge when we leave. But I do think that uh, we do have a moral obligation to accept the people who have worked with us. And one of the points that we make in the book is that we have been much less, uh, uh, w w we have not accepted uh, refugees anywhere near to the extent even in absolute numbers that Sweden, for instance, has. And relative to our population, it is really, you know, you can say it's an outrage that we have contributed, we've caused the problem, but we have not, uh, th these two million refugees that have left the country, we have not lived up to our obligations. We haven't even brought in the number that we said we would bring in to the United States. Although this isn't necessarily a cost, right? Immigrants can be an economic positive for the country. In the long run, right. but but the cost of there there the cost of absorbing them there's still a cost uh, of of absorbing them in the beginning. Let's come here and then we'll go over here. My name is Barbara Ween and I represent uh, grassroots peace movements. I'm on the board of National Peace Action and a variety of other uh, peace education foundations, and um, I guess I'm also here as a mother and um, as a citizen. I want to change the nature of the conversation a little bit. Uh, first of all, thank you for the book. Thank you for this tremendous contribution uh, to a real security debate in our country, which should have taken place before the war. Um, and I hope that you will work to popularize the book uh, with groups like the National Priorities Project and the American Friends Service Committee, who have websites on the costs of the war. Um, and I, I believe they're already using some of your research, but I hope you'll work closely with grassroots citizens groups across the country uh, to really look at, um, at uh, a, a real debate around this war. Um, one of the major problems that have been going on during the war is, is global climate change. Um, and I have felt so much that there's been a, a huge opportunity cost lost there had we not gone to this war, what would we be doing to try and stop the planet from melting down and, and global planetary crisis at this point? Maybe that's for your next book. <laughs> um, and also in the next version of this book, I'd love you to uh, look at what the opportunity losses were for, for Iraqi youth, um, uh, the loss of education, the loss of human potential of the next generation of Iraqi children. It, it, just, it just breaks my heart. I want to ask you, how did we let this happen? How could we have prevented this war from happening? So many of us marched and protested and got arrested. And here I'm asking you to take off your hat as an economist. What could the peace movement have done differently to prevent this war? We, there were tens of millions of us marching all over the war before the war even started. And what? How, Give me your advice. What could we have done? You're a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> <laughs> I wish uh, economics is easy. <laughs> yeah. Economics is easy relative to these questions that, that you're asking. Let me say, uh, let me just uh, say two things. One of them is the recommendations that we talk about at the end of the book in terms of accounting procedures, appropriations procedures. Uh, budgeting procedures, we think are designed to make it, make Americans 
feel more starkly the cost of going to war. You know, one of the problems is that war has become too easy, and our confidence in winning the first part of the war, that is to say the, 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 the shock and awe part, uh, we spend 52%, 50%, 49% of all the military expenditures in the world. And so there's no question about our being able to win that first part of the war. And that confidence that comes from being able to win the first part of the war uh, it, it makes it, may make it too easy for us to invade another, another country. And so uh, one of the things, that, you know, as I've thought about this issue is to realize that the kinds of checks and balances uh, that we think of as extraordinarily important in democratic processes are not adequate. They haven't been working well. In a way, the Constitution in the area of foreign policy was not well designed because we didn't have to worry about checking America. It was not a significant power. UK and France were our checks and balances. And they could not have envisaged the US as being the superpower. Now, the UN is supposed to be part of the checks and balance. And one of the interesting things is the UN deliberated, and people have not emphasized the role, the, the success of the UN. It deliberated and came out with the right decision. Except there are not grounds for a preemptive war, for a preventive war. There are not, you know, they were right. There, were no, there was not compelling evidence of weapons of mass destruction. But they didn't have the ability to enforce it. So... I think that, that as we think about that, we have to think about how do we put checks and balances. One way is to strengthen their national organizations. The second way, and most important, is to strengthen our democracy. And that means to try to figure out how do we have more accountability. And that's what these kinds of reforms that we talk about are designed to do, that to make it so that we don't, that no future president says you can have a war for free. And we say, no, we can't have a war for free. Um, and finally, I think there are a large number of issues that are presented by the media and the failure of the media. Um. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, th I think the fact was, you know, I, you know I, 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 there were these mass marches, and they were covered in Europe on the front page, and in America they'd be buried on page 11. New York Times wouldn't read report. There, there'd be a mass march in New York because, you know, you'd be there, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. Steve, that means you've contributed um, to the rise in the price of oil as well. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> and happily, I'm not uh, making story placement decisions. <laughs> yes. I'm Pete Chutley from Brookings, and this isn't a direct financial cost of the war question, but a question if you've come across an answer to my question in your research. I'm assuming that the administration, when Larry Lindsay said, gave its cost and he was fired and Wolfowitz said, this is gonna be free because Iraqi oil, the occupation will be free because Iraqi oil revenues will pay for everything. I'm assuming that they thought if the price tag were high, the American public wouldn't support going to war. Maybe that was behind their thinking, I don't know. But my question to you is, as you did your research, did you get a feeling for the willingness of the American public to bear burdens, pay costs for whatever, not just the Iraq war, but for other things, comparing this to past generations, et cetera? Have we gone soft? We're just not willing to pay costs for wars anymore? Or what did you come across as you did your research? Well, I, I'm not sure I found something that speaks directly to it. I can just reflect my own sort of views. I think that there's obviously a very big difference between World War II, where it was not a war of choice, and there was a sense, you know, it was, it was uh, good and evil. You know, it, there, was, there was a very clear uh, picture. In a way, during the Cold War, Vietnam had very, somewhat the same, you know, communism depriving people of freedom, but it wasn't just the freedom in, a, in Vietnam, it was the domino. And so the view was that if we, you know, it may have been a mistaken judgment, 
but it was a, a widespread feeling that there was a war, a cold war going on, and that we had to do, but do everything we could to to maintain the, the, our our side winning in that cold war. And the opposition, many, much of the opposition to Vietnam was not a disagreement with that moral responsibility, but a statement that this particular place for fighting that battle is not going to work. So much of the opposition was not to the motive, but to the ability to win the battle there. And uh, this war is, is, in that sense, fundamentally different. Uh, yes, we are, you know, th there was, and, and again, different from Afghanistan. If you'd gone to the American people and said, you know, is Afghanistan worth fighting? You'd say, well, we've been attacked, Al-Qaeda, we have to do something about it. Clinton had attacked Al-Qaeda. You can say there's a bipartisan view on that. The view was, there's no connection with 9-11 and Iraq. And the fact that there was such strains to try to create a connection that was not there, such strains to create a fear of weapons of mass destruction, plus such strains to hide the cost, I think my interpretation was that if you had gone to the American people and said, is this a war worth fighting? They would have said no. You know, there are lots of dictators in the world that are reprehensible. But by the way they would have commented, you gave, you supported this particular reprehensible uh, dictator for, for, for a, a decade. And now you tell us, oh, we shouldn't have supported him. <laughs> you know, there, there's a little bit of a disjunction there. So I think they would have said, well, go down the list and let's think of other dictators. If you want to use your military, let's find one that's a little cheaper. I, I don't think you could have sold it. I, I don't think you could have sold it if you'd been honest about uh, the, the benefits and the cost. Yes. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask you, uh, sir, about the defense budget issue. I mean, I, you had said that we're now spending 52 percent of the world's military. Uh, 49, I, I, I got it wrong. Wherever. 49, you think? Uh, well, it's, it's the highest level uh, in real terms uh, um, since World War II. In fact, it's at a level comparable to World War II. And I, I noticed <coughs> in, in calculating the costs of the war, one of the things you added in was the cost for restoring our military, uh, replenishing uh, war and equipment and so on. And both of our presidential, uh, well, all of our presidential candidates uh, are now arguing for increased defense expenditure for precisely that reason. And I'm just uh, wondering where you come out on that. I, I think maybe it's time to start cutting back a little bit on our expenditure. Uh, I think that what you're raising is is a, a, a fundamental issue. The Cold War ended in 1989, but our military strategies haven't adjusted to this new reality. And what we've been doing is spending huge amounts of money on weapons that don't work against enemies that don't exist. Now, you know, the good thing is if you're going to spend money on weapons that don't work, it's better to spend them on design for enemies that don't exist than for enemies that do exist. So you can say that, that that's, uh, we're lucky that there, these enemies don't exist. But going back to the point I was making, resources are scarce and America's needs are great. And I actually think that we could buy more security with less money and that we really need to begin to rethink uh, our, our defense budget. We need probably to spend more money on anti-terrorism. You know, we, we, we may want to need to have better ways of, of inspecting our ports that allow us to, you know, you know, our goods are coming through without the kinds of security that we have to go through every day and every time we go into the airport. Well, if you are going to smuggle, you know, if, if you're going to try to get things into the country, obvious way to do it is go through the weakest link. You're not going to go through the airport. So it's clear we haven't thought through 
our, our security needs, I think, in a, in a, in a deep way. And, and, and uh, I think we can get, as I say, more security for, for less money. I think it's really important because what we have done in the last eight years has let some of our basic needs go unattended. Infrastructure, you know, the Minnesota bridges, the hurricane, the, Menace, the, the New Orleans le levees. Not one of the top ten airports in the world lies in America. So we do have lots of needs. Our healthcare system is, is not functioning as well as it should. You know, outcomes are not equal to that of uh, other advanced industrial countries. So we have lots of needs. And where are they going to come from? Take one more. I'll take one more question. <coughs> oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, Eduardo Cepeda, Carnegie. I'm going to follow up on the Marshall Plan. Um, you sort of uh, went into the cost of the war to other countries. Uh, the, the increase in the price of oil, of course, hit many countries, especially poor countries. The, now there is a coincidence uh, between the causes of the war, the way the war was financed, and uh, recession. We are going to need some money uh, going into areas in, and into countries uh, that are going to go into a recession that might be worse otherwise. So what, is, what are your ideas about this? Uh, relating that cost and an eventual Marshall Plan that should follow uh, the end of the war? Uh, well, let, let, let me try to put this in a little bit broader uh, perspective. Um, I mean, you are right that uh, actually the world is going through some very difficult times right now. And it's, it's uh, I think, from an economic point of, point of view, one of the hardest times to navigate because we are both facing the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression uh, and inflation. Those are two, by them, each by themselves, a difficult problem. The, the, the reason, you know, just very, very briefly, the reason this is the worst economic downturn, all <laughs> other economic, and to which the war has, has contributed, but the, the, the previous economic downturns in the post-war period particularly have been attributed to either in excess inventory accumulation where you just let the inventory decumulate or worries about inflation, the Fed steps on the brake too hard. It goes into a downturn. Everybody says, "Oh, you've stepped on the brake too hard," and, and the and the Fed steps off the brake, and the economy starts again. We've devastated a core part of our economic system, the financial system, uh, and and uh, restructuring, reconstructing that is not going to be easy. And it's going to take time. It will happen, but it will will take time. Inflation. The problems of inflation are worse than normal. Because this is oil now spread to food because of the biofuels that brought these two together. Standard tools won't work. China, for instance, is facing a problem of inflation. Vietnam is facing a problem of inflation. If they raise the interest rate, it's not going to do anything to global prices of food or fuel, or not very much. So all the standard remedies that we've taught people are irrelevant to this kind of imported inflation unless you're willing to have a real depression to get unemployment rates so high that wages start to fall. And I don't think anybody, you know, the cure would be worse than the disease. Where this is a really problem is in developing countries. Because in developing countries, oil and food represent a very large part of their market basket. And they are seeing food costs going up. Uh, it, it is a real strain on their food importing countries. Now, the other point I was going to make is that a lot of people think that we could fund a Marshall Plan out of the peace dividend. But one of the points of our book is that the peace dividend is going to be less than many people think because we have these unfunded obligations for the veterans. We're not going to be able to disengage right away. So that, in fact, there's not, we're not going to be sitting on a pool of money. 
Quite the contrary. I mean, our point is that if we try to stay the course, we're going to have to spend more and more money. So the problem is that, yes, I think we ought to have a Marshall Plan. I think particularly we have a moral obligation to help Iraq. I think we ought to, we, we ought to be helping more, you know, we ought to be living up to our obligations that we've agreed to, to the developing countries, and this is a real time where they're going to need that help. But then you start looking at our budgetary situation, and that's where you come down to, to, to the, the, the hard reality that we have to do something about the defense budget. Great. Good, gentlemen. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> the book is The $3 Trillion War. It's available in the back. Please go buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Sure. Stiglitz and Steve Muston. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. 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 That's great.